The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on Thursday, May 6, 2021. 10.42 a.m. Have we ever spoken of Denville Curry? Is he of the Dell Curry line? Nope. Denville Curry is the man with no vocal cords. He's from the hills of West Virginia, but the farm market on Route 23 is here to tell us his tale. And, somewhat surprisingly, he tells his tale too, using his voice. We have Hell is Real and Denville Curry signs? Ohio is the best. Have you ever watched Mr. Denville's YouTube video? It's pretty remarkable. No. Brad watches Denville Curry, man with no vocal cord video. These type of things make me uncomfortable. Also, how does he still have that same accent? <laughs> how do they make you uncomfortable? The idea that this guy gets his miracle and all these other people around the world who are as good of people or better and deserve divine intervention get nothing. I see. But there must be some value, whether or not there is any validity to the experience he claims, to him using the story to inspire others, no? It makes me uncomfortable. Either he is lying, the power of positive thought resolved this, or there is a higher being and that being is pretty much a jerk. None of those things make me comfortable with ascribing this to a higher power. I certainly feel some of those same things, but I also feel like the simple act of believing, be it secular or religious, can have such power. Alas, that power can be used for good or evil. And that fascinates me to no end. In what do we believe? Why do we believe it? But most importantly, what do we do with what we believe? And that's what makes me uncomfortable. Tying his recovery to a very specific worldview that a being spoke to him directly makes it hard for me to get behind it. If it is positivity, it is minimized impact due to a narrow worldview. If it is a flat out lie, then that also minimizes the broader value. And if it is a higher being with that kind of power, then that being is a jerk, mean-spirited, or a flat out sociopath. It's tricky. For me, I'm always thinking about what potential we have as human beings, but potential cuts both ways. We've all seen religion weaponized both in the present day and historically from all different sides. And so many of the things that people have done under what they believe to be the guidance of their religion, or under the cover of that religion, are so appalling. But I suppose the same is true of any type of belief system. You can use things for good or for evil. And I think of organizations such as the Church for All People here in Columbus, which really reaches out into the community and tries to improve lives. I think of how the community, and in particular the church, supported our parents after their car accident. And I struggle with the people who carry out such wonderful things based on teachings and beliefs which can also be used to cause so much damage. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the Brothers Drew Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about a man with no vocal cords. Maybe we'll talk about cats falling from tall buildings. Maybe we'll talk about the immeasurable concept of belief. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. That's how it works, some things I text my brother. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But as always, before we commence talking about our current text exchange, Let's go back and talk about the ones that came before it, because there are always going to be some additions and corrections that can be made. And that brings us to our recurring segment, Ablusions and Edification. So, an ablusion is a cleansing. We're addressing the things that we might have gotten at least a little bit wrong in the past. And we're going to start with a very meta ablusion. Yet again, it falls on my shoulders. It's the fact that for the entire first episode, I called ablusions... Abolutions. And it was actually kind of painful to listen to the whole time. So I'm going to try from now on to say ablutions in edification rather than ablutions in edification. And that's really all I have. Brother Brad, do you have any ablutions this week? Well, I actually have an ablution that is also an edification. Uh, we talked Ooh. about conservation in a previous exchange, and you asked me the definition. And I said the definition of conservation is conservation. Not true. Uh, the actual <laughs> definition of 
An actual definition of conservation is prevention of wasteful use of a resource. Wow. Basically, that definition you just gave is essentially conservation. I believe it is. And then I want to go <laughs> into an edification. I feel like this is going to be a recurring thing. I didn't really pay a lot of attention to government nudges to get us to do ah. certain behaviors. So and, we're going uh, back to that first episode again. Back to the, the first Lucha episode. Libre in the mines. And uh, we have in this great state of Ohio, the Vaximilian Lottery. So if you were vaccinated uh, for the COVID vaccine, you could enter a $1 million lottery that will happen five times. And I just read that New York and Maryland are following suit and offering lotteries of their own for vaccinated people. So wait, normally for me to be entered in a lottery, I'd have to go into a convenience store. In that store, I would buy several pounds of candy and a Slurpee. So I would come out probably less healthy, a little bit poorer, and I wouldn't win anything. You're telling me I can be entered into a lottery in which I'm entered in simply by doing an act of kindness for the rest of humanity? Doesn't cost me a thing, and I can still lose just as easily? And be healthier. Count me in. Well, I think that wraps up this week's ablutions and edification, which leads us to today's topic, that dramatic exchange that you heard at the top of the show. was all about a man named Denville Curry. It's a YouTube video that's a roadside sign, a little bit outside of Columbus, Ohio, actually near a town called South Bloomfield, Ohio. There's a roadside sign on Route 23, and it just on, in big letters on a yellow backing says, Denville Curry. The man with no vocal cords, YouTube. So, of course, this leads us to YouTube, but it can lead us to a lot of places. Brother Brad, what do you want to talk about? So, this is a this is a, a challenging topic for me. It to is. Get, it really is to dive into because there is absolute power in belief, and I would never dream of denying that. And a lot of what I probably will say here over the next however long we talk. It's going to be a result of what I would consider my accident of birth that resulted in me having a comfortable, thoroughly mediocre life. <laughs> we did not have any major traumas as kids. Not really. Right? No. You know, a few old people no, I mean, died. And- the pool exploding. And who was it that, that rode the tidal wave into the neighbor's yard? Is that I mean, you or me? I don't Traumatic, know. but it didn't take a miracle to save your life. And we didn't need to find okay. God to find the reason as to why it happened and why why you lived, right? And I'm not. But you're saying you're saying you didn't have terrible things. Aren't you also the person whose light jacket button got caught in the chains of a swing, and you were slammed into the ground by a swing set at the local park, and you didn't have trauma as a child? Not that led me to think I had experienced a miracle to survive. <laughs> okay, I've derailed you. Proceed with your actual course. And I, you know, I haven't been gifted with athletic talent to the point where I have to <laughs> no, think. No, no, ladies and gentlemen, he was not. That's <laughs> so all. I don't have to. I don't have to look at the miracle of that. You know, by by my thoroughly normal life, it's harder for me to believe in miracles because I haven't had to experience them. I haven't had to look for that level of belief to wonder why things happened or didn't happen. You probably don't know this, but when I was getting ready to graduate from high school, I was really considering joining the ministry. Right? I thought really strongly becoming a Methodist minister. I thought that's what I wanted to do. And then I realized I, I generally dislike everyone. And being a <laughs> minister who hates people, probably not a good career choice. Well, so I have gone from wanting to be a minister to probably moving through deism and John Locke and, and all those folks and their rejection of, of revelation as a valid source of religious knowledge, which precludes superstitions and miracles and things like that. And I probably have ended up in a place of apathetic agnosticism mm. where there I'm not denying that there's some sort of higher power. There was not some sort of creation that happened, right? But mm-hmm. I also don't know that I can ever get to a point where I can feel like I would be able to reason it out and understand it to the point where I could believe in something because it just leads me down that path of turtles all the way down. Like if the if the world was built on a turtle, turtles back, that's where the earth is. What's underneath that turtle? Well, another turtle. And underneath that turtle, another turtle. And it just that that resonance continues all the way down the path. So if there is a God. I like turtles. I like turtles as well. If there's a God who created that God and who created that God and who created the universe and who created that person that created that universe, it just goes on. And I I can't get there. So I'm probably an apathetic agnostic. But clearly, people with positive outlooks and views on life have positive things happen to them 
or at least they believe they do, at a higher rate. What Denville Curry went through and losing his vocal cords and being able to to speak again is amazing and incredible. I tend to believe there's a scientific explanation somewhere in there. We mm-hmm. just ha- He may not be looking for it or not care to find it uh, because it supports his worldview and his belief led him to feel like it's his belief that got him back. Maybe it was. I just can't get there myself. For the listeners out here, if you've made it this far in the podcast without putting a brief pause on our podcast, only the briefest of pauses, you need to go out and check Denville Curry's video. You can see how it's spelled in all our episode notes and all that. You Google it, it'll be the first and only thing that comes up. So just as a refresher course, if you've seen it long ago or if you haven't managed to watch it yet, Denville Curry is a man, he says he's from the hills of West Virginia. He has that accent that Brad mentioned. And he says, I want to let you know a little bit what's been going on in my life for the past few years. This video was posted in the year 2014. In watching the video and going back through some YouTube comments and some other things I found out, what happened was in 1982, Denville Curry went back from his home in central Ohio to his childhood home around West Virginia. He sat by his mother's grave, cleared it off a little bit, fell asleep at the grave, even though it was a night cold enough that it then began sleeting, raining, and snowing. He woke up later on. He had a cough that he could not suppress. It got so bad that he spit out his vocal cords into a handkerchief. Eh, The science of that, you know, maybe we'll get to that. Probably not possible, but he coughed something out, whether it was a rock or some phlegm, I can't say. But from that point forward, he couldn't speak for 20 years. He couldn't speak. The doctors at OSU on the night that he first went there said, Denville, preacher, you're going to have to learn sign language. You're going to have to learn to live without a voice. I have no idea whether Denville did learn that or not, because he generally advances in his video by just saying, so anyway, and then we skip 20 years. And he's in a car again with his wife driving back from West Virginia. And well, actually, he had asked God, God, where is the miracles for me and my children and my grandchildren? How did he ask God that? He tells us that. He says that he asked him in his mind because he didn't have a voice and God talked to him in his car. He said, Denville, just look in the mirror. And I did, says Denville. When I looked in the mirror, I said, Lord, that's only me. And the Lord said, look again. And Denville said, Lord, that's only me. But eventually the Lord told him, if you do what I tell you to do, I'll take you where you want to be. A few weeks go by and Denville's driving through Waverly, Ohio. He's listening to the radio. And God tells him to go into this church. The prayer is already in session. The preacher calls he and his wife forward. He gets on the stage. He's handed a microphone and he begins speaking. As Denville says, he begins speaking fluently, just as he does right now, which by the way, if you haven't watched the video, he has a voice that I would definitely want to hear the soothing sounds of Denville Curry telling me about God. But he had it that night. For the first time in 20 years, he was speaking and he was so wrapped up in the moment. He and his wife, they were so wrapped up in the spirituality of the moment that it wasn't until later that evening after they got their sandwich at McDonald's that they realized he had actually vocalized. And that's a big deal. And it all comes down, I would say the end of the video, but there's a lovely segment of of Denville singing three beautiful hymns at the end. It all comes down to Denville kind of summarizing this saying, you see, obedience is better than sacrifice. When God says something, we need to obey. You can have your miracle if you believe. All things is possible to them who believe. And that does take it very much back to what you were talking about, Brad, is like, who's entitled to those miracles? Why does one person get the miracle and another not? Why does it take so long for people to get the miracles? Why do some people who seem like the greatest believers never get their miracle? or become convinced that they have received it when maybe nothing has changed. It's a really tricky topic. I don't know where I stand on it. I I agree with you that religion is like so many other tools that can be used, but it's a much more powerful tool because as I was working on writing my, my book this summer, writing about this pilgrimage that I took a long time ago, I was realizing how much more in terms of what humans see themselves as, how they perceive themselves, where they think we need to go in life, belief matters so much more in that process than reality. Your belief, in essence, becomes your reality. I was thinking about, I watched years ago on NPR, I watched a a series of conversations with this guy, Joseph Campbell. It was called Power of Myth. He talked a lot about how over time, what we believe and those, those foundational myths Uh, that offer us life models 
have had to change and evolve as we as people have changed and evolved. We used to have many gods and you had God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of the earth, the God mm-hmm. of the sea, the God of the wind, God of life, death, war, all of these things, because there were so many unexplainable events. Over time, we started to understand things a little better. We learned mm-hmm. a little bit more. Then we moved into one God that was able to create some miracles, generally speaking. Obviously, there are still many religions that have multiple gods or different views on, on God, so I don't want to lump them all together. But that idea that over time, old religions belong to a different set of people. And so, I wonder a little bit about when or if that changes with what we believe are miracles today and how, you know, how we define a miracle. So, what, what is a miracle? I was watching a video last week of a cat who jumped out of a, off the fifth story of a building that was on fire, landed in the grass, walked away, no problems. Is that a miracle? Is that an accident of the wind? Is there a scientific explanation because cats are more capable of, of landing on their feet than can fall softly? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but there's that could <laughs> easily be considered a miracle, right? And if it is, why did God choose that cat to save, right? That cat is not religious. Cat is not asking God for deliverance, most likely, right? So and if wh- that cat acts like most cats, he's probably a jerk, right? So where do you draw that line? You know, what's what's science and, and what's miracles? And part of the challenge for me is getting past some of that to get to what really is a miracle and, and how we define all that. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it defines a miracle as the following. A miracle, at first in very rough approximation, is an event that is not explicable by natural causes alone. A reported miracle excites wonder because it appears to require, as its cause, something beyond the reach of human action and natural causes. Historically, the appeal to miracles has formed one of the primary lines of argument in favor of specific forms of theism. The argument typically being that the event in question can best or only be explained as the act of a particular deity. That's a scholarly journal defining it, but it's still up to the different branches of theism or the different belief system to determine what they find as miracles. And then we have to determine, all right, is this a miracle? And then so many miracles gone by, as you said, miracles of the the past might be realities of science now. And I was reading about miracles debunked in all faiths and Christianity and Islam and and Hinduism and Buddhism. I was reading of of these different miracles that have occurred within all those faiths and and how several of them have been debunked. Sometimes it's really simple stuff, Uh, like the Hindu milk miracle was one that I thought was a good example. On September 21st, 1995, a worshiper in a temple in New Delhi proffered a spoonful of milk near the mouth of the statue of a prominent Hindu god, and soon enough, the milk was gone, apparently slurped up by the inanimate statue. That's pretty cool. So we fast forward, the news is spreading, and Hindus around the world are taking their version of that statue, putting milk in front of it, and the milk is disappearing. And then scientists took physics into play. When the milk came into contact with the statues, the surface slowly pulled the liquid into the statue. Capillary action may have also played a role. Furthermore, they noticed the milk dribbling down and pooling on the ground. No drinking was taking place. This miracle is not really a miracle. But what's more important, the veracity of that miracle in the first place, or the fact that these people who see this miracle had their belief systems reinforced, that it helped them maybe use the positive aspects of their religion going forward in a more confident way because they they had seen their belief system acknowledged and in their mind proven. And that's something I come back to so much with this is, you know, religion just has that power. And then there's there's also, you know, that it's the power of belief. It's the power of community, having a belief system that gives you hope gives you something to live for, to fight for in terms of continuing to to push through challenging times, challenging issues. So you have some level of hope. And again, this back to my comfortable, thoroughly mediocre life. I haven't had to count on the afterlife as my time of comfort because I've had some of it in my life. You know, I'm not Bill Gates wealthy, but I, you know, I have enough. I'm happy enough. My life has been good enough. I haven't ever known what it was like to starve. I haven't known what it's like to spend three years without a job and not know where my next meal was coming from or be evicted from a house every two weeks like some, you know, other folks might have been. When I look at that, I haven't had that need to look at that, look for miracles, look for that afterlife to be what my hope and drive to stay alive. Yeah, and it's during probably our family's single most challenging moment, which occurred a decade and a half ago, 
we as adult children of our parents were faced with our parents being in a car accident and hospital beds rolling into our house after a few days of, of them being released from the hospital and having to do some things to be able to make sure that everything they needed was happening from helping our, our father even clean off because he had a broken neck to just managing all those daily tasks that they were they were always taking care of and putting meals together and all that. And you and our, our wonderful sister, Angie, always lived nearby or did at that time and were able to consistently be there for our parents in all scenarios before the accident. But you had to go to work at some point after the accident. I had a job that allowed me more flexibility. And frankly, I was in the state at the time just riding a bicycle around to write my first book. But I had this chunk of time available and I ended up being there every day. But I was there every day as an extremely immature and, and selfish person at 26 years of age or something along those lines with no real ability to take care of people. And into that void during this most challenging moment in our, our family's history, at least that I can think of, came a community, a community of people armed with crock pots, good wishes, flowers, and everything else that you could hope. And that community was formed of friends and neighbors, but it was also formed very much by the church. And our, our father, Father Art, born a Catholic and a practicing Methodist for decades, is a man for whom faith has been a positive force in his life. That connection to the church, I think, and, and maybe we'll ask him, I think that was affirmed for him as the community came up. Now, would a community have shown up for our parents without the church? Yes. And, and some of them absolutely did, you know, independently of the church. But there's no doubt in my mind that the church was there. And um, for Denville Curry, going back to the video, is it possible to spit your vocal cords out into a handkerchief? Well, six hours on Google today tells me no. But I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I, but I, I might Denville be. Curry... <laughs> Denville Curry believed he spit the vocal cords out. And anyhow, whatever happened for 20 years, he got his voice back. But I was doing something dangerous. I was looking at the YouTube comments under his video. 40,000 and some people have seen this video. And a few of them were out to do your standard trolling. Like, you know, you have to be a special kind of crazy to believe this, more or less, would, would I guess summarize some of those comments. But a lot of those comments were from people who were saying best wishes to him and that they appreciated his message, but they were also saying how his message helped them. Here's one YouTube comment that I think is worth mentioning. We are from Charleston, West Virginia, traveling to Columbus, Ohio to Nationwide Children's Hospital. My two-year-old son is having his entire skull reconstructed tomorrow due to craniocentosis, and I really needed this message today. So, I don't know what happened in 1982 on the night that Denville Curry started coughing really hard. Paralysis can and does occur. That's a regular thing, but it doesn't end up with your vocal cords in a handkerchief. But whatever happened to Denville Curry that night and whatever happened during the 20 years that he summarized with a, and anyhow, when he came back and started speaking to people and posted this video on YouTube, it meant something to this presumably young parent taking their child to a surgery in probably one of the more challenging things that had happened to them in this lifetime. And there's, there's such a value to this happening. And there would be some who would categorize the Bible as the word of God. And there are people who would consider it as an anthology of fairy tales. I don't know what it is. I'm probably never going to figure that out. But Denville Curry is using it for positivity, at least in terms of the little glimpse into this, I think, about 70-year-old man's life. The one piece that I know is him using the story that's pretty well out there to help people. He even puts his phone number. He responds to that comment. He puts his phone number and says, tell me how it went. Now, is it crazy to put your phone number on YouTube? Probably. Is it crazy to spit your, your vocal cords into a handkerchief? Probably. But his reality is not necessarily his truth. I heard a quote years ago watching Northern Exposure, and I looked it up because it has stuck with me for a long time. And I looked it up, and I could not find an actual attribution. I don't know where it came from uh, or who it belongs to, and I spent a good couple hours trying to find it. But uh, basically, the character, Chris in the Morning, who did a radio show, Chris Stevens, Chris in the Morning. So he did a radio show. Didn't he end up dating Terry Bradshaw? Wasn't Terry Bradshaw the quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers? <laughs> <laughs> yes, move on. So, Chris, <laughs> sorry. Chris in the morning says the healer's art at its best is insight wedded to compassion, and thus medicine, no less than religion, is a matter of the spirit. 
And that has always stuck with me. And I think it fits here. It's it's the idea that he had gotten to a point in his life, Denvo Curry, where he wanted to get better. He always did, right? But he got to the point where he was starting to lose a little bit of faith and he needed it to happen to support his worldview, to support his career, his life, his passion of being a preacher. So how much of it was a miracle? How much of it was at that moment, he just got to the point where he just believed so strongly and he needed to believe so strongly that it just fell in place. If he had paralyzed vocal cords instead of having actually lost them or some other scenario, scientific scenario, it was just enough to push him in that right direction. And it was just a timing issue. He felt a change and that change was a miracle to him. And and that's great. And I'm happy for him that he has that livelihood and that he's spreading the positive message and not using it in a negative way. But I also look at it as how limited is this message? Because again, it's an accident of birth. Someone like Denbo Curry or, or someone else who's very passionate about a religion, if they had been born in a, in a Muslim country, would they be just as passionate about Islam today? Would they be just as passionate about Hinduism if they were born in a, hin- a nation or a locale where it was heavily influenced with Hindu? religion. So how much of that is is attributed, you know, to this religious belief set versus his strength of spirit being part of the the medicinal arts. Yeah. And I thought he tried to drive home at kind of the end as he was wrapping things up before he launched into singing the song My God is Real. He said the phrase twice, obedience is better than sacrifice. And it sounds like we both agree that belief is an incredibly powerful thing. It can be deployed in all different manners. It can generate from all different sources. But belief is a powerful thing. But I've been trying to wrap my head around what he was saying with obedience is better than sacrifice. I, I just, what and what sacrifices is he telling us not to do in favor of obedience? I just, I couldn't figure that out. And I do wonder if there's a, a quote that goes with it um, from, from the Bible. So there probably is. Yeah, so there, there is a quote. So a, a quick search will tell me that in 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. So it's clearly something from the Bible that resonates with him very strongly uh, to the point where he'll pull that out. So obedience, according to the Old Testament here on this site, means to hear or to listen. So he was called to believe at that moment by God, to be obedient in that moment, led him to be healed. Yeah, well, that goes with what you were saying earlier about like at that moment, that was the message he needed. He was he was ready for it. I think that's a very valid point. And going back to um, when God originally spoke to him about this, he said, God told him to look in the mirror. And Denville said, Lord, that's only me. And he said that one twice. And then I feel like when he was done looking in the mirror, he felt empowered that he was no longer looking at just himself. He was looking at it and seeing this greater power over his shoulder and maybe maybe parts of the community we've talked about. And uh, I don't know that that changes. In fact, I know that doesn't change my belief system. But I had, uh, I was actually uh, in a call with a group of students this week from a, from a school in Iowa. And we were talking about a bunch of different things um, related to, to my day job, which is taking people places to see usually historic things or whatever. But we got onto all different subjects talking about food and, and movies and you name it. And one of the students came up and asked me, you know, what is, what is my favorite? I think she said, what is my favorite Bible verse? And I was a bit taken back because for one, I could probably spit out for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, and, and probably that's about it. But very quickly, after kind of staggering on my feet for a second, I realized that the, what matters to me most, and I said, find me a quote that's about humanity acting as a community and serving each other. And that will be my favorite quote in the Bible. No, it makes sense. Know. We've talked about it, and I think we're in the, in the same place. Belief is powerful. Belief can be positive. Belief can be negative. It's all about what you do with that belief and what you do with that community of believers when you have them. You could be Jim Jones and Mm. you can make everybody drink the Kool-Aid. You can be Charles Manson and just be a sociopath and psychopath, really. Or you can be Mother Teresa and you can take that responsibility in in your community as your as your life, as your goal. You're called to do to serve and you go serve in a way that betters everyone around you. 
and leaves well, right the world around a better the corner, place. The, the church in my neighborhood, which is a neighborhood that that has a lot of, of struggles over the past several decades, uh, the Church for All People, I, I think it's Methodist affiliated. I'm not even sure of that. But it came in to serve the community outside of the doors of a physical building. It did so by creating a fresh food market in an area uh, that is a, a grocery store desert. It did so by creating a bike repair shop where you take your bike in and pay what you can and, and they'll deal with it. Of course, it has other outreach programs dealing with you know more traditional things like employment and supporting people with substance abuses and, and all those things. Um, I don't know that if I ever believe, ever will believe in a God, but I will definitely believe in a church that serves the community. And uh, I certainly see that around. And, and hopefully that's what Denville Curry is doing. I could probably find out soon because on my way past the same farm market where the Denville Curry sign uh, is posted, which by the way, the farm market has actually belonged to a family that has been farming in that area since the late 1700s. They, they've been there forever. They ran this farm market from 1959 until 2018, closed it down. And now some of the signs which used to advertise pumpkins saying, you know, take all you can carry, those faded letters are on the back of a sign, which is now advertising a old fashioned Fashion tent revival with none other than Denville Curry at the center of it, neighbors of this family. And I don't know if the signs have just been up for a while. I went onto Google Maps and just looked up the area again because I wanted to refresh my mind. And the signs were up in the Google Maps video. It was from 2019. But in 2021, I drove by and I'm seeing signs that this June, mid-June, there is an old-fashioned tent revival and we could go and we could listen to Denville Curry talk about signs, wonders, and miracles. There's another sign that has a person being baptized in it. I think it's on the back of that one that says, you know, carry all you can carry from that old pumpkin stand that's right next to it. Maybe I need to go and give Denville a listen. And I don't know. But I'm curious to talk to him about what happened to his vocal cords because, by the way, vocal cord paralysis is a real condition. Like I said earlier, it doesn't result in you spitting out your vocal cords. The most common cause is a nerve leading to them getting damaged in surgery, but we believe viruses and other things can do it too. There are mixed results as to how much you can do to help repair these vocal cords when they are damaged, but vocal cord paralysis is real. I was looking at the Wild Cornell vocal cord website, and uh, there are surgeries and things that can help with these problems. Denville Curry, at least from what he said on his video, didn't talk about having any surgeries or further help. I did watch a YouTube video of this one woman who went to the Cleveland Clinic, a great hospital, and she had, I think, your vocal cords do not necessarily both get damaged. If a nerve is hit, it's one that gets paralyzed. The other is fine. And you can probably still produce some sound, if not the same sound as before. Um, but she actually, after 30 years of basically being able to generate a whisper, which is not backed by what we would traditionally call a voice, which is presumably what Denville Curry said he had for a while. He could he could talk with a whisper. But she went in, had a surgery done, which basically moved her vocal cord to a position where I think the other vocal cord could connect with it and vibrate against it. And um, her voice literally started to come back on the operating table and got better from there, never to 100%. But certainly the full type of voice that uh, Denville Curry speaks with. So up until the point in his story, where he drives to West Virginia, I believe it. Where he cleans off his mother's grave, no problem. Sits there and falls asleep in the snow and hail, maybe a little bit weird, but why not? Gets strep throat, starts coughing a lot, cool. Coughing out his vocal cords into a handkerchief, eh, I'm not so sure. Being unable to speak for 20 years, but then it coming back miraculously? I mean, it's his truth, but is it mine? I don't know. So maybe he left out some notes and the and anyways, left out a visit to a hospital or something like that. But uh, the vocal cords are kind of an interesting thing. If you look into the research, well, if you don't like weird diagrams of things, don't watch because it, it's gross to watch them expanding and contracting and doing all these things. But they're, they're kind of essential. So keep your vocal cords, kids. That's my best advice. In all of your research, because I asked this question in the text exchange and I, I forgot to research it myself, I really want to know how Denville Curry, without any vocal cords, could still have a southern accent. <laughs> without the vibrations and the controlling of pitch modulation that the vocal cords do, how does he have an accent? I don't know. But I will tell you, I'm glad he has the accent. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if... 
Do you whisper with your same accent, Brad? Well, I, I don't have an accent, obviously. This is mm. Midwestern. Uh, Midwestern accent is really the only way to speak English. But I, I do want, I want to know if it's really controlled by the vocal cords. But I also want to know if you could speak without an accent. Is there even English without an accent? Is there even a thing? Does it even exist? What does English sound like without an accent? I think accents all come down to perception. The person you're talking to has an accent if they don't sound like you. Yeah. And really, that's, 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 fair. Always, that's always the truth, no matter who you're talking to. They have the accent when you're surrounded by people of, of your own background. And if you become the stranger in a group house where you have the accent, and that's the only really dynamic that changes it. Denville Curry was always going to be Denville Curry, I guess, even at a whisper. But well, I, I did read once, children are, you know, babies are born with the ability to make all sounds that humans can make. So, oh, at first I thought you were going to say all sounds, like a baby can be the sound of a choo-choo train and a velociraptor. Right. Which well, they could be make pretty the sweet. sounds that we would associate with those things. So any accent. What does a velociraptor sound like, Brad? Uh, uh, probably like a pterodactyl. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Isn't that what yep. it was in that pizza commercial? Ah! So if you can make all the sounds in the language, right, at some point in time, then accents form and all those things. And we can't always get it back because our vocal tracks are trained. So without the vocal cords, where does the accent come from? Because that's clearly how you train your voice over time to be able to make the accents that are familiar to you where you grew up in the language that you speak and the sounds of those languages and the accents of those languages. So I'm just fascinated by the fact that he still has an accent, but no vocal cords. That's a good call. I don't really have anything else that I want to add to this. I just, I hope that anybody who listened to us today just knows that we were talking through where our head is at and we're not judging any of you on what you believe or what you don't. We hope that whatever you believe in is a positive force in your life, both towards yourself and your family, but toward others as well. And if it is motivating you in that way, just like it did for Denville Curry, then I'm glad it's there for you in your life and in your space. And I hope it continues to guide you to doing the good you want to do. I will say miracles. I'm not saying it's aliens, but maybe it's aliens. <laughs> the only person who could add anything more to this conversation, although he's not an ordained minister or a pterodactyl or a velociraptor for that matter, is our Father Art. And we're going to ask him some questions. How has your faith been a positive force in your life? I think just the uh, sense of, of community that comes from being a member of a church has, has benefited me and, and bolstered me in, in times when maybe I was down a little bit. During your time as a religion writer, did you ever attend an old-fashioned revival? Um, close. I, I don't think I ever went to a re revival tent, but uh, some of the, uh, I did go to a couple services or meetings in, in Pentecostal type churches and they were, they were pretty crazy. Usually uh, the more um, evangelistic the, uh, the denomination was, the more, they, the more they proselytized, the more formal churches usually didn't, uh, didn't bother with uh, proselytizing. Denvo Curry had a great epiphany at a McDonald's when he and his wife realized that he had just spoken for the first time in 20 years. What is the best moment you've ever experienced at a fast food restaurant? I'm drawing a blank. I can't think of anything that uh, stands out in my life, long lifetime of visiting fast food restaurants. So it's not in uh, your experience, but uh, one time my children, we went to a, we were on our way to Chicago and we were on the turnpike and we stopped at a restaurant and uh, I went and ordered food and I came back with the food and both of my kids were licking the wall. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. I did, th I did think of one that, that doesn't uh, directly in involve me, but uh, one of my favorite fast food moments was when you uh, wore a, a graduation, a kindergarten graduation cap at a at a Taco Bell after you graduated from Boise State because you missed the graduation at Taco Bell Arena. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We said just about everything we can say about Denville Curry, about vocal cords and handkerchiefs, about the power of belief. But fear not, there'll be another episode coming your way soon, as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, just like we did this time. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about things that you liked, things that you didn't like, or to tell us something that we need to include in our ablution and edification segment. But most importantly, if you can hit the likes or the subscribes or tell a friend or anything that'll help them find us, the fraternity of Drew Yards will be forever grateful. We will talk to you next time. Well, let me, let's just do a word association thing. You can respond in any way you like. What comes to mind when I say the name Leroy Jenkins? Leroy Jenkins. So I was going to name my dog Leroy Jenkins. So <laughs> I did not want to get another dog. I love dogs. I love them. I love everybody's dogs. I want to pet them. I want to hold them. I want to chase them. I want them to chase me. I don't want them to lick me, but I want to play with them. I love dogs. Dogs are the best, but I don't want to own a dog because I'm lazy and I don't want responsibility. So I said, the only way I'm getting a dog is if I get to choose the name. And I want to name my dog Leroy Jenkins because I want to run down the street when he runs away and be yelling, Leroy Jenkins down the street. At least you have chicken. At least I have chicken. I lost on that i for a moment i had killer cuddle muffin and then for a moment i had arthur james drew your jr <laughs> <laughs> that should have happened but i lost on that one too uh, so we ended up yes. with oliver cromwell audience leroy jenkins is an old um, viral video at this point even before videos were going viral i think go and look it up but the reason I mention this to you now, brother, is because you may be, or you wouldn't be one of the only people who appreciate it, but only people who know the Leroy Jenkins meme or whatever that's called will have any idea. As I searched for Denville Curry, I saw that he commented on, it was one of those websites where I don't think it was from the funeral home, but after a person had passed away, people can write their memorial comments on there. And this was for a person who had a whole bunch of these comments dating back to, um, I forget what year this was, but one of the people who had commented on this was Denville Curry. And I could not believe that the person that Denville Curry was memorializing was Reverend Leroy Jenkins. <laughs>